My name is Skip Rutherford. I'm dean of the Clinton School, and we're glad to have you this afternoon. If I could ask everyone to please turn your cell phones and electronic devices off. I want to say that uh, um, we're honored to have this program on one uh, here today. It's, it's something we've been working on for a long time, and I really appreciate people helping make that happen. Two people who did are Little Rock connections to one. One is Sarah Huckabee, the, my friend and the daughter of uh, former Governor Mike Huckabee. Um, and, oh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, but I still call her Sarah Huckabee. She is a new mom and, and uh, has been helping. And then Tyler Denton, uh, who formerly worked with the Clinton Foundation and who is now with one and is a longtime friend uh, as well. So I appreciate the Arkansas connections. Uh, I guess it's a little timely for me to introduce our, uh, the student who's going to uh, present the, the introduction of our speaker because uh, Saturday at uh, War Memorial Stadium, the uh, University of Arkansas plays the University of Mississippi uh, in what has long been an interstate rivalry and that is heightened by the fact that it is now being played uh, here. Abby Olivier is from Hattiesburg, Mississippi. She majored in public policy leadership at the University of Mississippi and has volunteered everywhere from an orphanage in South Africa to a farmer's market in that wonderful town of Oxford, Mississippi. She has a personal connection to one, which I'm sure she will talk about uh, in her introduction. And in, uh, at the Clinton School, uh, she's working on a project near and dear to my heart, uh, and that is exploring the adaptive reuse of the Blue Bridge, the old bridge which crosses the White River in Newport, Arkansas. Uh, and it is one of those rare opportunities for a small Delta town uh, to have the opportunity to turn what we have done in Little Rock, old bridges uh, into pedestrian bridges and gathering places. And this is one of the few bridges, the old ones that are remaining. Uh, and it's really an exciting project for our students to work with the city of Newport and the citizens of Newport. Um, and I, uh, I love it. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's one of the most exciting things we've done. That bridge uh, is on the National Register of Historic Places. And I'm glad Abby is part of the team working on it. Please welcome University of Mississippi graduate, Abby Olivier. Thank you, Dean Rutherford, and thank you all for coming out on your lunch hour to experience this, what I hope to be, and I'm confident to be, an exciting and but serious and insightful um, lecture from Michael Elliott today. I am an Ole Miss graduate, so I'll see you all all Saturday at War Memorial Stadium. Hotty toddy, have to say it. Um, but thank you all for coming, and I just kind of want to tell a quick story about my connection with the One Campaign. Last year, around this time, the One Campaign issued statements that over a billion people in the world live off $1.50 a day. And that number and that figure is kind of hard to comprehend and grasp the how how that would how that would be in our own lives. So one challenged college students to try to live off $1.50 a day. And I was a senior at Ole Miss and decided to recruit some students and a professor to to go up to that challenge. So we did, and midday I'm in my professor's office scarfing down the few peanut butter crackers I was going to have for the day, feeling pretty gluttonous and somewhat shameful that that's you know, something that I never have to experience. And it was a really moving experience because I knew I could not do that every day. That one day, okay, I made it through, but the, the rest of the week and the rest of the month, I wouldn't be able to handle that. And this challenge from one and this experience is exactly why I love what the One Campaign does. They, um, the One Campaign portrays international issues in a way that Americans can understand and sympathize with. They pose real problems to deep-rooted issues, and they allow me, as a public servant, the opportunity for that perfect mix between advocacy and activism. And that's something that public servants try to strive for. 
So today, we are lucky to have the leader of this organization, Michael Elliott. Mr. Elliott was born and raised in Liverpool and attended Oxford University. He was a professor at various universities in the United States and the UK, and he received tenure at the London School of Economics. He's been a member of the Central Policy Review Staff in Britain's Cabinet Office. Before joining one, Mr. Elliott pursued a career in journalism where he worked for The Economist, Newsweek International, Fortune Magazine, and most recently was the editor of Time International. Now he serves as president and CEO of the One Campaign, fighting, elim fighting for the elimination of poverty and preventable disease in Africa. When joining the One Campaign, Mr. Elliott stated that he was happy to start working with what he truly believed in. Thanks to his willingness to lecture to us today, we'll get great insight on issues that we truly believe in. So I'm humbled and overjoyed to introduce Mr. Michael Elliott. Well, uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, thank you very much, Abby, for that uh, for that lovely, completely undeserved introduction, and uh, and Skip Rutherford, who I now can't see, uh, but anyway, there he is, Skip. Thank you, uh, thank you for that too. It's uh, it's it's wonderful to be back in Little Rock. Um, I got in last night, you know, nine o'clock, ten o'clock, uh, and uh, I wanted to I wanted to try and find the precise spot. Uh, where I was standing on that November evening in uh, in 1922, uh, 1992, <laughs> 1992, uh, outside the old state house when uh, when President Clinton uh, gave his uh, victory speech after the 1992 election. So I found exactly where I was standing. Uh, it was a long night, as you can imagine, very long night, um, quite an exciting night. Uh, I'm sure some of you uh, were uh, were there in the crowd. Remember, it was cold. Remember how cold it was? Bitterly, bitterly cold night, kind of clear cold night. Uh, and I had a 7.30 uh, flight to get back to Washington, uh, where I was based the next morning. And um, I woke up, and it was 10 after 7. Uh, fortunately, I was staying uh, at a hotel out by the airport because, you know, the capital and all those places downtown were full of much more important people than me. So I, I, uh, I, I, I threw some clothes on, rushed downstairs, didn't bother checking out, grabbed a cab, got to the airport in five minutes, did something I've never done before or since, just kind of went to the front, just kind of said, excuse me, and went kind of straight to the front and ran to the plane and kind of got the plane as, uh, as the doors were closing. And I always remember, it's funny how these things stick with you. Uh, that Representative Jim Cooper from uh, from Tennessee, who I knew from Washington, was just kind of laughing so hard as he saw me kind of struggle into the plane uh, and uh, and uh, make my way back to Washington. So I have kind of very happy memories of, uh, of the time that I used to spend down here uh, during those great days uh, of, uh, of President Clinton's first run for office. And it's lovely to be with you all here and, uh, and to see so many. I just had uh, lunch with some of the students uh, at the school and to kind of um, visit with them and, uh, and see so many people who are interested in, uh, in careers in public service and, uh, and following the great traditions that, uh, that you have here in the state. We, we, practically have a, we practically have a regional office down here. I mean, we've got Tyler Denton, our TRIPS director, uh, is here. Uh, I've got uh, in the room with us Sarah Huckabee, uh, who's been absolutely magnificent this last year in, uh, in leading our uh, uh, our campaign to make sure that our issues are front and center in uh, in election races. Uh, Abby Sasser, our regional director, is uh, is over here. Uh, we've got two congressional district leaders uh, who are with us: Kayla Nunez and Autumn Jacobs. Why don't they just kind of wave their hands? Where are they? Because uh, they do they do a terrific job with us. We've got more than 7,000 members in uh, in Arkansas. So hey, we could we could relocate here from Washington. We could you know we could just move down here. Uh, so thank you all for coming out to kind of listen to me uh, chat about what it is that we do and why the foreign assistance budget is one of the best investments we'll ever make uh, and how to campaign for it. We're an organization uh, co-founded by, uh, by Bono, the uh, singer and activist, and Bobby Shriver, a, uh, a wonderful guy who's a uh, son of Sarge Shriver, the founder of the Peace Corps, uh, and others. Uh, and our job is to be an advocacy and lobbying group around the world 
for making sure that smart, effective assistance flows from the richer countries of the world in the global north to the poorer countries of the world in the global south, and particularly in Africa. So while well, I, this is a phrase that we kind of tend to, tend to use internally, but as it happened, Bono said it in, a, uh, in an interview in Dublin last week, so I'll use it. We're well, like the NRA for the, uh, for the poor people of the world. Uh, <coughs> Extremely effective organisations. So I, you know, have no uh, no hesitation in uh, uh, in linking uh, our uh, character with uh, with what it is that they do. Uh, we go out and we lobby for we lobby and advocate for assistance, uh, smart, effective assistance that transforms, saves, and improves uh, the lives of countless millions. We're headquartered in Washington D.C. because obviously a lot of our work involves working with the U.S. government and on U.S. government programs, uh, but we have significant offices in other places where there are pots of money uh, that we can lobby for. So we have a big presence in London uh, and also in Brussels where we talk to the European Union leaders, in, uh, in Paris, in, uh, in Berlin, uh, and an office and a growing presence in Africa too, headquartered in Johannesburg, uh, so that we can actually get closer to what it is that African governments and African people uh, actually want in terms of, uh, of the development relationship. Uh, we've got 140 staff uh, around the world, uh, and as Abby said, um, uh, I'm the CEO of it, a job that I've only been doing for 15 months uh, after a career mainly but not exclusively spent in, uh, spent in journalism. As we, do, as we do our work, whether it's in the US or in Europe or in Canada or Australia or elsewhere, we often come across a misperception and I'm sure you have too, uh, that an extraordinarily large amount of national budgets uh, is spent on uh, on foreign assistance that you know and it, uh, we spend as much on foreign assistance as we spend on education or on transportation or whatever it is uh, and part of our job is first of all to puncture that misconception and then to explain to people what we get for the generous generous but in the grand scheme of things relatively small amounts of money that we transfer from our uh, pockets to those of people less fortunate. So every so often we kind of go out and we kind of talk to people on the street and we ask them how much, uh, how much uh, they think that we spend on foreign assistance and then we explain how much we really spend and we ask them um, what, uh, what they think uh, we get for it. So Abby, let's, let's do the first man on the street video. about the money the U.S. spends on foreign aid and why? I think too much money is spent outside the country when we have homeless here and children that go to bed hungry or they don't get the proper education. I, I don't have much information about, you know, the foreign aid or how much of our um, funds or attention goes toward it. There's a lot of aid that's needed at home that's being overlooked. Why would we do that for them if, if we need to do things for us? Well, that's a big question. It's, um, it's definitely a lot of times misplaced. What percentage of the U.S. budget do you think is spent on foreign aid? 20%? 25%? 30%? 15%, 20%? I have no idea. What would you say if I told you it was actually less than 1%? Oh my god. Didn't even, wouldn't even think that, actually. And I thought 5% was low. <laughs> How many more children do you think started going to school in Africa between 1999 and 2008? I really would have no idea, honestly. I'd say maybe less than a million. I'm just going to take a guess here, 1.5 million. 46.5 million African children are in school for the first time. Wow. I was way off. Wow. That's amazing. That's really cool. How many people do you think are receiving life-saving AIDS treatment? Four million. Two, three million. At least two million people getting AIDS treatment. 6.6 .6 million people are on life-saving therapy, up from just 100,000 in 2002. Just with less than 1%. Wow. Ridiculous. Yeah, awesome. How many people do you think new agricultural programs have helped in the last 20 years? I guess it's not something that people are very aware of, so not many. Maybe, I don't know, a million? I'd say a few million. None? I'm going to say little with any. One billion people. Oh, oh my God. Of one billion? That's a lot of people. Wow. 
Do you think it's part of American core values to have a humanitarian agenda? Do you think it's part of the American identity? It should be. We always talk about trying to help each other. You're supposed to care about your neighbor and worry about other people's business all the time. Why not worry about people that are on the other side of the world? There's pieces of America all over the world. You know, we were founded by immigrants. You know, I think everybody has a piece of them in any other country you can think of. So I think it's really important to give back. I think it is um, part of our a duty almost to help people worldwide in every way that we can. What would you say to members of Congress who are looking to make cuts to the budget from these life-saving programs? Um, well, I mean, if it was at 15%, I would think that we should cut it. That's what my original thought was, but now that I know, I think that it should go up. I say it's a, a, a huge mistake. There's a million places where I'm sure that they could find ways to cut before they cut the 1% that we spend on foreign aid. People need help. We should help. So we find, when we, we find that when we go out and talk to people and we say less than 1% of the US federal budget goes on overseas, uh, overseas development assistance, and that gets you an astonishing amount. That saves lives, literally, 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 saves and improves lives. The people get it. The people understand uh, why these are fantastic investments. A, there was a figure there uh, uh, about the number of people who are on life-saving antiretroviral drugs uh, that, uh, that treat or, uh, HIV AIDS. <clears throat> Ten years ago, there were 100,000 people around the world on ARVs, and, most, uh, and of those, only 30,000, 40,000 were in Africa. Uh, we now have more than 5 million people uh, in, uh, in Africa who are on life-saving antiretrovirals. It's been an extraordinary, absolutely mind-blowing change in the, in the way in which we think of, of HIV AIDS. Ten years ago, we were thinking that HIV AIDS was an unstoppable pandemic that was going to decimate middle classes across Africa. Uh, that was, there was nothing that we could do about it, effectively. Uh, and we're now looking at a situation where we can literally begin to say that we can see the beginning of the end of AIDS. Uh, and that's because, let's be clear, that's because of the generosity uh, of American taxpayers, not just Americans, of, uh, of other nations too, uh, but the, uh, the extraordinary generosity of American taxpayers backing programs that have been supported by politicians from both parties, by people of faith and not of faith, uh, by conservatives and liberals who've come together to recognize that these are terrific investments. Since we started reducing the debt of, uh, or forgiving the debt of highly indebted countries 14, 15 years ago, something like 47, 48 million kids uh, have been able to go to school in Africa that hadn't gone to school before. So for, for large amounts of money, but in the grand scheme of things, quite small amounts of money, uh, we've been able to do amazing things. We've been able to kind of really save lives. Every time we, uh, we go out and explain what it is we do to people, and we say to them, so now you know um, what these, uh, these dollars actually deliver, do you think it's a good idea? They say, yeah, we think it's the right thing to do. This is a kind of generous and compassionate country. It's been that way uh, since its founding. Uh, and, uh, and we find that, uh, that people respond to, uh, to the facts when we give them the facts. But of course, it isn't just a question of, uh, of the heart. It isn't just a question of supporting these programs because they save lives, though they do. There's also a question of the head. Our world will be a more peaceful and prosperous world if we're all prosperous, if, uh, if we all have uh, the ability to, to live prosperous lives in which uh, families can imagine uh, that their children are going to do better than, than they were, that families are going to see that their children have benefits that they didn't have. I spent uh, a chunk of my uh, working life living in, living in Asia, based in Hong Kong, traveling all over Asia had a profound effect on my, on my worldview because when you look at the world from the Pacific Rim looking, uh, looking west rather than sitting here looking east, the world looks a very, very different place. Uh, in, uh, in Asia, you can almost visibly see families get more prosperous, uh, 
their children kind of do better than their parents could ever dream. Uh, you move from a, a, a hut to somewhere that has a fan, uh, to somewhere that eventually has air conditioning. You move from a place where you're working 364 days a year to a life where you can take weekends off and then eventually where you can kind of take vacations in Australia or wherever it is. Uh, and when you can kind of see uh, the kind of gradual improvement in life chances and prosperity, it's a very, very moving thing. Well, this year, six out of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world will not be in Asia uh, or Europe, they'll be in Africa. Uh, so as we, as we see the African uh, continent develop, uh, as we see the impact, not just of development assistance, but of the, of the skill and, uh, and hard work that Africans themselves have put into their economy, as we see the consequences of all that, then we can imagine a world uh, where uh, there's greater prosperity and where there are eco economic opportunities uh, for all, for American companies as well as for European country, companies, African companies. And beyond that, uh, prosperity and improved life chances uh, are a security uh, imperative for us too. Extremism breeds in places of poverty and disease and misery. And one of the things that we've discovered in this country in the last 10 years is that extremism doesn't stay in the places where it's born. So if you can kind of create a situation in which people can imagine that their kids are gonna have better lives, able to go to school, not gonna die young, uh, then that has a, a significant uh, geopolitical impact. Uh, it makes our lives more secure, more prosperous. It helps all of us. How do we do what we do? We, we play what we call an inside-outside game. Uh, we have very, very skillful, extremely effective uh, lobbyists, Bono, others, staff that we have in Washington and London and Brussels and Paris and elsewhere, uh, who go in and talk to um, uh, our champions uh, in Congress, in the administration, and other places, who, uh, who, who understand what we do and who, uh, and who advocate for our programs uh, among their fellows. And, and there, are no, there have been no bigger champions in, uh, in the American political system, uh, it should be said, than, uh, than Governor Huckabee uh, and former Senator Lincoln, who, who penned a wonderful op-ed on the virtues of, uh, of foreign assistance just this week. Who, uh, it was in Politico, the, uh, the online magazine. Uh, but we have many, many champions in, uh, in, many, uh, uh, in many legislatures and, um, and governments around the world. And the wind at their sails are our members, 7,000 members here in Arkansas, more than 7,000 members here in Arkansas, who are tweeting and sending emails and writing petitions. And uh, there's a young lady from Greece who I was having lunch with uh, today who said, you know, I write all these petitions. I sign all these petitions. What happens to them? Well, you know, uh, the petitions that she's writing about uh, the European budget, uh, the reason why when I'm in Brussels, which I was a couple of weeks ago with Bono, I can get to see pretty much anyone I want to see because there are millions of members who are signing those petitions uh, and, uh, and uh, convincing political leaders that there is a mass movement uh, in favor of the advocacy that we do. So that inside-outside game uh, is extremely important to us. And we try and be, you know, we try and be a little sexy, a little, as our co-founder Bobby Shriver would say, a little rock and roll uh, about what we do. Uh, we try and kind of uh, be provocative, be a little edgy, uh, and be a little creative. So at the, at the um, G8 meeting of the leading industrial countries in, uh, in Camp David this year, the, the key uh, thing that the leaders uh, from around the world were gonna talk about that we really concerned about was agriculture, was investment in agriculture, investment in nutrition, uh, and uh, making sure that funds flowed from the rich world uh, to smart investments in agriculture programs to fight hunger in the poor world. And we'd been running a campaign for the last few months which we call Thrive, so that everyone can kind of really thrive uh, through, uh, through agricultural investment. Uh, and we thought we'd dream something up uh, which uh, meant that the leaders who were gathered in Camp David uh, wouldn't forget 
uh, that millions of people around the world were watching what they were doing when they talked about hunger and agriculture. So let, let's have a look at the street tweeter. A couple of months back, we started um, this amazing campaign called Thrive, which is about breaking the cycle of poverty and hunger for good. Since the launch, we've been blown away by the response from our three million members. We wanted to find a way and make sure that our members' voices would have as much impact on the G8 as they were having on us. So we created the One Street Tweeter. of digital and analog. It takes downloaded tweets and it tells 80 different jets how to spray what and when and sprays these eight-foot characters out on the table. On, on the road to Camp David, expect to see what matters to our members around the world. So that was, uh, that was pretty cool. I mean, we got messages flooding in from all over the world. Thankfully, one of the first messages from, was from Governor O'Malley of Maryland. So it was sort of, well, if he says it's OK to kind of spray his message on the street, we're OK. All right. Uh, and uh, so we, we tweeted these messages all the way up the road to Camp David. And then, as you saw in the shots in Washington, we actually tweeted them outside the White House, too, uh, because the DC government gave us permission to do so. And, uh, and when people came up and said, you can't possibly do that, we were happy to say, no, no, the DC government says that we can do these tweets on Pennsylvania Avenue. So we did that too. So we kind of try and be, we try and be provocative and edgy uh, in what we do. We try and, we try and make, uh, make our work a lot of, uh, as fun as we can so that our members uh, are as engaged in it uh, as, uh, as we possibly can. And we have one other advantage, frankly, uh, which is that we have uh, a founder who, uh, as well as being the world's Preeminent, there's no question about it, uh, activist on, uh, on um, poverty and uh, humanitarian uh, assistance, uh, something that he's been doing uh, for much, much longer than most of the politicians that he talks to, uh, has quite a few friends, it turns out, in the, uh, in the music and uh, Hollywood business who he can occasionally get to rope in uh, to help him with our message. So this time last year, when uh, there was a um, uh, significant famine, if you remember, in the Horn of Africa, uh, we decided we'd do a little video that pulled in Bono and a few of his friends uh, to really get the message out that we needed to do something um, uh, to really kind of bring the tragedy in the Horn of Africa to, um, to uh, um, people's attention. And as you will see, if you watch the film very carefully, a native son of Arkansas helped us on the uh, journey. Famine is the real obscenity. Famine. 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 30,000 children have died in just three months. 30,000 children. In just three months. The worst drought in 60 this years. Devastating parts, parts of Africa. And 12 million men, women, and children are on the brink. In 2011. Really? Are you kidding me? Now we know how to stop. We know how to stop this. We know how to stop, stop this. this. Early warning systems. Food reserves. Better seeds. And irrigation. More peace and security. Drought is an act of nature. Famine, Famine is man-made. Man Famine. Famine is man-made. Famine is man-made. Go to one.org. Let's put a end to famine. Your former governor, your man. Uh, he's a, he was very, thank you, sir. He was a, uh, Governor Huckabee was a very good sport on that. Uh, so that's what we do. Uh, we, uh, we, uh, we play an inside-outside game. 
We try and be edgy. We use the friends that we have, that we're lucky enough to have uh, in the artist and talent community. That leverages our message. We try and uh, we try and promote the message internationally, so not just in the U.S., but in other countries uh, where there's uh, where there are pots of money uh, that can flow from the from the north to the south. We want to put ourselves out of business. We don't want to be doing this forever. Uh, we want to be a part of a story that ensures that the developing parts of the world uh, are solving their own problems, uh, living their own lives, making their own choices. Uh, this is not something that anyone wants to do forever. Uh, but we believe, passionately believe, uh, that there is much to be said right now for using smart, targeted, effective assistance uh, at a critical moment to make sure that the progress that's being made in the poor parts of the world continues and that we all live in a world of greater peace and greater prosperity. And that's why we think the foreign assistance budget is one of the best investments we'll ever make. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to take some questions. <laughs> How long, how long have we got? 25 minutes? Yeah, we're, we're, we're good on time. As long as you want. As long as so you want. if you raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you so everyone can hear you. Caroline, right behind you. Yeah. Good afternoon. Thank you so much. I first learned about One Campaign actually as an intern at CARE in, in Atlanta and have since um, come to learn a lot. And so I have about five questions, oh but if God. you can only address two, because I know the time. So um, number one, coming, um, speaking actually about the G8 summit, and I, I watched it, I streamed it, and I saw Bona on there, and a lot of the speakers, there wasn't um, a farmer in the room except on a board. And so to me, it's very ironic that the millions of people that you do speak about, you're advocating for, and their voice, their voice is actually not in those rooms. There are millions of farmers you work with, it is to me, I can't understand why one of them couldn't stand there and say, this is my situation in Kenya, in wherever. And so if you could address that. And then that also ties to your campaigns. Yes, you had a whole bunch of celebrities talking about famine, but if you do have staff on the ground, why wasn't one person from the Horn of Africa saying, this is what's going on? And not that that person speaking has a child with the belly and the flies and everything going around. So if you could um, just address that one section. And then the second question is, the oh, that foreign, was I'm that sorry, was the foreign aid and the assistance that goes um, to these countries for like the free primary education is actually funded, but then these governments are corrupt. And so I'm from Kenya and there's a big scandal that the government's ministries are using this money to procure and being corrupt. So we're actually funding corruption. Thank you. Great question. Terrific questions. Uh, terrific questions. Let, let, me, let me start with the first one. Uh, your question about why wasn't there a farmer at the G8? Fabulous question. There's no answer to it. I don't, uh, I don't choose the, uh, the, um, the guest list of those who are invited to Camp David. I imagine the US government does, but you're absolutely right. It would have been a fantastic thing if an African farmer had been there. They did invite, they did invite, let's be clear, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, African heads of state went up to Camp David and some other African leaders. And in fact, the day before Camp David, we did a meeting with a bunch of Africans. Uh, Bono and I and, and others uh, uh, did, a, uh, did a series of meetings with the African leaders who were in town. We organized a press conference for the African leaders and so on and so forth. But your point about not actually having uh, real life farmers uh, in the room when these, uh, when these uh, matters are discussed is, uh, is is absolutely right, and um, uh, governments should remember that. Your point about corruption is exceptionally well taken. Our organization has always uh, been committed to transparency in, on both sides of the aid equation. Bono likes to say that the two people who know least about aid and assistance dollars are those who give it and those who get it. 
Uh, we're trying to do what we can to make sure that those who give it know where their money is going to, but we need transparency and absolute clarity uh, about where money is going both places, both in terms of here, in terms of where the aid is going, so the taxpayers and voters know what their hard-end dollars are going on. That's critically important. Uh, and at the same time, we need transparency in, uh, in the poor world too, uh, so that uh, organizations there uh, can track money that's flowing there. We took a leading role in, uh, in passing legislation in the US Congress uh, this year to make sure that every extractive company, mineral, oil, gas company, that is listed on the US Stock Exchange uh, has to be public about what it is paying to foreign governments for leases and concessions and what have you overseas. And our argument is that when that information is public, when you actually know what's being paid to foreign governments, then over time, parliamentarians, NGOs, civil society groups, brave campaigners in Kenya and Uganda and Ghana and lots of other places will be able to look at the data that is now transparent and hold our governments accountable. This is a long game. You know, you're entirely right uh, in what you say uh, about the, the, the curse of corruption. One of the reasons that corruption is a curse uh, is because natural resource revenues uh, tend to be stolen or hidden. And that's why we think, as, as Justice Brandeis said many years ago, uh, that sunlight is the best disinfectant. Uh, so we've been uh, arguing very hard and very successfully, actually, uh, to make sure the data on revenue uh, that come from oil, gas, and minerals is made public so that uh, ordinary citizens, you know, your friends in Kenya and others, can hold their governments to account for the way in which that money is spent. Anyone more else? questions? There's got to be more, more questions than that. Gentleman here. It seems to me that uh, environmental sustainability issues are a key part of this. Could you say a little about that? I, it's, the gentleman asked uh, whether I think that environmental uh, sustainable issues are a key part of this. Absolutely, they are. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm chairman for the next two years of uh, the, uh, the kind of high-level panel set up by the World Economic Forum in, uh, in Davos uh, to look at issues of poverty and sustainable development development, and we've put the two of them together in, in one council rather than having them in separate councils. So no, of course you're right. Um, if you look at the Sahel, the, uh, the southern band, uh, uh, the, the band that stretches across the, the southern edge of the Sahara from the Atlantic to the, uh, to the Indian Ocean, uh, going through uh, very, uh, very significant uh, drought at the moment, uh, and I think kind of an, an awful lot of people uh, would say that the, that the extremely difficult conditions uh, that one has in the Sahel are a combination of unsustainable farming practices, uh, probably a degree of climate change, all of which breeds, incidentally, very significant political extremism. Uh, I was in Mali a year ago, actually with Tyler, uh, this most fantastic country uh, with incredible culture, um, amazing music and silverwork and so on. Uh, and we were there like three months before the whole thing blew up, right? Uh, and now uh, you have kind of uh, the whole of the north of Mali kind of controlled by, uh, by um, real extremists. Uh, so um, you're absolutely right uh, that sustainability uh, is, a, is a key attribute that one needs to keep in mind over the next 20 years. I'm actually optimistic uh, about, uh, about um, questions of environmental sustainability. Uh, I think in the in best practice in agricultural development, and for that matter in urban development uh, around the world, is already showing that it's that it can be done in a sustainable way. Uh, what we need to do is to kind of scale best practice, take it from places where it's already established and take it to places where it's not so well established. That's a long process, but it's something that we'll all be spending a lot of time in the next 20 or 30 years thinking about. Terrific question. Thank you. More. I'm sure there are more. 
Where are all these well, students? Yes. You have tons of students in here that you talk to them all. You answered all yeah, the questions. Yeah, I talked too long at lunch. It was such a good presentation. You just answered right. all their questions. Well, uh, Michael, thank you so much for visiting Little Rock and, and the Clinton School. Tyler, Sarah, Abby, thanks for all your help in doing that. And hope to uh, see you at the next one. Thanks again. Thank you.